All right, hello everyone, and uh, thanks for coming to our talk today. We're pretty excited to be speaking in the ICS Village for the first time. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, an O-Day that we found in an ICS system. This is actually going to be somewhat of a redo of our talk on in track two yesterday, but we're going to focus a lot more on the challenges we faced specific to ICS systems. So first of all, who are the two crazy guys standing in front of you? Uh, my name is Doug McKee. I work for McAfee's Advanced Threat Research Team. I've got a little over eight years of experience in vulnerability research and, and pen testing. And, and I'm Mark. I'm also a researcher at McAfee's ATR team, and I have a little over eight months of experience in vulnerability research and pen testing. All right, so first, what are, what are we here to talk about today? Um, obviously, it's going to be an ICS system. And for this, it's Delta Controls and Telebus Manager. And, and this is a building controller. So what building controllers do is they're installed in commercial and industrial buildings to manage things like HVAC, access control, uh, pressure rooms and hospitals. And they do this largely over a, a networking protocol called BACnet. And that stands for Building Access Control Network. And this is, not, um, this is not proprietary to this Delta system. It's actually the same across the industry. And so when we started looking at this system specifically, we kind of ran into uh, what we like to call the perfect storm. And, and one, that's also why we started looking at it more heavily, is one, it's network connected, and these are connected to the internet, right? So we always like to look for vulnerabilities that are network accessible because they tend to have a higher impact and they give us a really good place to start from an attack surface. Uh, also, when we started looking at the device, we found that it had an active UART header on the board that did not require any authentication and it dropped us right into a root shell, which allowed us easily to extract the firmware and to start debugging. And when we extract the firmware, we also found that the developers had left symbols in the binaries, which again made things easier for us to move forward and I'll reference this throughout the presentation. And last but definitely not least, as most ICS systems do, that run Linux anyway, they have a BusyBox installed. And in this instance of BusyBox, Netcat was left installed on the box, uh, which became extremely useful when we get to our post-exploitation phase. So I'm going to give you a really short, high-level uh, understanding of the vulnerability and the exploit. Uh, and then we're going to focus on some of the challenges. So first, what is the vulnerability we found using broadcast packets, backnet broadcast packets, uh, that we were able to find a buffer overflow. We were able to turn that buffer overflow into a right what where condition and use it to gain control of execution. So once we gained control of execution, we were able to redirect execution to shellcode, uh, which we were able to put on the heap because of the buffer overflow. So. A little bit more about the vulnerability. This is what it looks like in code using the I to D compilers. I've got it condensed here. Um, the simplest way to look at it is we have a standard buffer size mismatch. So in the top diagram, we've got a buffer that I've labeled source, and it's being set to 1,732 bytes, and it's being read directly from the wire. A little bit later down in the code, we have a second buffer being allocated to 1,476 bytes. As you can tell, those sizes are not the same. It's eventually used for a mem copy, and therefore we have a buffer overflow. And to, in order to get that to use to gain control of execution, we used the right what where condition to do something called a GOT overwrite. So if you're not familiar in Linux, the GOT stands for Global Offset Table. <coughs> This is a table which is populated at runtime, therefore it's generally writable, and it basically is a match between function name and address. So in our case, one of the functions in memory was SCD code backnet, UDP, and this function was very close to where we found the vuln, and so therefore by overwriting the address for that function, we were able to redirect that function pointer to shellcode which was stored in memory. So the shellcode uh, as I said, we controlled a very small amount of memory on the heap, uh, which made shellcode slightly difficult, but we were able to do a little bit of hopscotch in, in memory to jump around and actually get our shellcode to work in memory. We did a classic return to libc attack and leveraged the netcat that was already installed on the system to gain a reverse shell. And with that reverse shell is kind of the basis of where everything starts, uh, and from there we're able to exploit their further infect and exploit the system. <coughs> Excuse me. So I said, if one of the things we want to focus on in here is the challenges we face during our process for ICS specific systems. And so like most people, static analysis is great, but we would really rather use dynamic analysis as much as possible in the exploitation process. It's just simply easier. So in order to do that, we, we 
compiled GDB server for the appropriate architecture and we dropped it on the system. Now, as soon as we started using GDB, we were instantly messed with a bunch of error messages and then the system rebooted. Now, the, the error messages have been redacted here at the re request of the vendor, but the gist of the error messages were that there was a watchdog timer that failed, kicked the system, and therefore the system reboots. For those not familiar, in ICS systems, watchdog timers are typically used uh, in order to ensure that if the system hangs for any period of time, an action is taken to stop the, to, to get it back going again. And in this case, the action is rebooting. Well, that's obviously going to be not, a, not good for dynamic debugging. <laughs> But because we had symbols and because we were able to uh, use those error messages, it's actually pretty simple for us to find in software where this is taking place. Here you can see that there's three areas where a counter is being decremented by five, and, and when the, the counter hits zero, it reboots the device. Well, from a software research perspective, this is actually not a hard problem to solve. All we have to do is a technique called binary patching. And we only need to patch one single byte in the entire binary. So what we did is we changed that 5 to a 0. And by changing that 5 to a 0, the code still executed, but it effectively didn't do anything. In fact, you can see up here on the screen on the right-hand side that IDA doesn't even recognize that that line exists anymore because it's completely ineffective. So we did this and started debugging again, and we were successful for an entirely total of three minutes. And then the system rebooted again, and the watchdog got its revenge. And Mark and I were trying to figure out, we just squash the watchdog. Why is the system rebooting? Well, again, something specific to ICS systems is there wasn't just a software watchdog, but there was a hardware watchdog, which is very common in, in ICS systems, and we had forgotten to handle the hardware watchdog. And so you can see that here on the UART screen that a hardware watchdog is being set every 180, for, up to, for 180 seconds every time on boot, and otherwise three minutes. So the important thing about hardware watchdogs is that if we have to deal with them as security researchers, the developers also have to deal with them. Which means if the developers have to deal with them, there's already code on the device to handle this problem. You just have to find a way to get access to it. Well, in our instance, the developers had exported all of their functions to all of their SOs, meaning that all we had to do was write a very small C program, import their libraries, and call their functions, and have that boot up on start, and now we were able to kick the watchdog in the exact same manner that the developers did to prevent the device from rebooting. So by employing both of these two method, methods to handle the software and the hardware watchdog, we were able to debug the system dynamically, which was extremely helpful for the rest of our research. So we faced a couple more challenges, and for these, to explain these, I'm going to hand this over to my coworker, Mark. Thanks, Doug. Uh, so yeah, the next challenge we uh, encountered is that we wanted to get this exploit to work remotely. Up until this point, we had been conducting the attack on the same network that the device lives on using broadcast traffic, which was nice because we didn't know, need to know the IP address of the device, but ultimately we wanted to expand uh, the impact to be worldwide. Okay, so how would we go about doing this? Uh, as you may or may not know, the attack as it stands uses broadcast traffic, which normally does not travel over the internet. Well, thankfully, a certain BACnet technology came to save the day. And that BACnet technology was BBMD, or Broadcast IP, or sorry, BACnet IP Broadcast Management Device, which is sort of a mouthful, but suffice it to say, uh, it allows for the uh, communication of BACnet broadcast traffic, the exact kind we're using, to travel over the internet. And so in the diagram on the right, you see two such BACnet networks connected over the internet, and each of them have a BBMD system. So the way this works is that traffic intended for a foreign network is first sent to the source network's BBMD. It uses unicast traffic to send it to the destination network's BBMD, whose job is then to rebroadcast that traffic. That's all well and good, but how does this help us? Well, ultimately, by using this technology, we discovered through testing that this actually gets our exploit to work entirely over the internet. I want to reiterate, at the time of this writing, any EBMGR device connected to the internet with its default network settings could be pwned 100% remotely using this exploit. Now, this is not the end of our challenges, not by a long shot, because after all, up until this point, all we have is a root shell to the device and persistence. This is very nice, but ultimately we're more interested from an impact perspective from controlling the hardware on the other end of this device, whether this be HVAC systems in a data center, access control in a government building, or uh, pressure rooms in a hospital, that's where the real impact lies. We need to get control of those. So our initial hypothesis was to use the programming already on the device and see if we can get that code to work for us. Uh, the first approach we used was to try and look at the database files located on the device's file system. And these contain some information about the state of the I.O. hardware. 
Now, the first thing that jumped out at us when we looked at these database files is that I had no idea what the hell I was looking at. Uh, this was too complicated, so we decided to keep looking. Uh, the next thing we try to look at is controlling the I.O. state directly from the touch screen as you would in normal operation. And then this actually generates loopback traffic and we decided to, if we could investigate how these packets are structured and maybe replay them, we could get it to work for us. And uh, those paying close attention might notice that the packet structure is actually very similar to the database files and that I still have no idea what I'm looking at. Uh, so we try something else again. And uh, what we ended up, uh, what ended up working for us is actually hooking to the uh, functions that control I/O natively. And you see one of the, these functions in front of you from GDB output. And uh, once again, symbols being left in proved invaluable here, since names like can I/O write output proved to be uh, a huge, uh, you know, indicator. This is a good place to start since we knew that all the I/O modules are handled through the CAN bus. Now, uh, through some further reversing of these I.O. control functions, we discover there's actually different functions for handling all the different categories of I.O. And there are six such categories for the EBMGR. You have uh, inputs, outputs, variables, and any of these can be either analog or binary. Now, the idea would be to alter the parameters going to these functions in order to get the code to work for us, but the question is which parameters do we alter and how do we do it? Well, for that, we did find one key commonality between all these various functions, and that's the first parameter being sent. The first parameter, as we discovered, is actually a data structure that describes the hardware being altered. In particular, this data structure for the first four bytes are the ID or the fingerprint of the device, and this is unique to each one. At a 12 byte offset, we also discovered the holds the current state of the device, which is the most crucial component. But additionally, at a varying offset, you could also find a descriptive string of that device, which is how we know this one is responsible for monitoring room temperature. So using this information is actually pretty straightforward to alter these data structures coming into these functions and thus get control of high I.O., at least in theory. So using this information, we were able to craft malware that uh, took advantage of this hooking method in order to control the I.O., but ultimately we had another uh, challenge in front of us, and that challenge was that Unlike the watchdog kicking code, which we could just throw some C code onto the device and have it run, execute some functions that exist in memory, uh, the handles to the I/O hardware were trapped inside the program space of the existing programming. It could not be accessed normally from an external program. Somehow, our malware had to be inserted into the memory space of the existing programming to do its job. How would we do it? Well, the solution ended up being something called LD preload. And for those that don't know, LD preload is a Linux environment variable. And shared objects it points to are loaded first by dynamic linker when a binary is executed. Now, this is not a new or novel concept. We've not come up with this. It's actually a pretty common strategy in this field uh, for inserting code into the existing program's memory space, which is exactly what we wanted to do. So in our case, we used persistence on the device in order to set this variable to point to our malware, and uh, thus we could insert it into the device's programming. But then the next challenge was, where do we put it? Well, here are our options. So this is a rough overview of the, the, the programming startup routine. And through some further reversing, we des, uh, decided that the best place to put it would be this function called canio init, highlighted in yellow. The reason being is, as Doug mentioned previously, this is a vastly multi-threaded application. It runs many threads in parallel. And in order to avoid race conditions or inconsistent behavior, we wanted a function that was called early initialization, called once, and called by a single thread and this function met all those criteria. So what does it look like once our uh, baby malware is inserted here? Well, uh, once this function is executed, our malware starts up and it runs a thread in the background that listens for commands sent over the network by the attacker. Uh, it listens on a TCP port. And uh, depending on the content of these commands, uh, the malware will then intercept uh, the corresponding calls to the IL control functions, alter the parameters as I mentioned previously, thus granting us control of the hardware. Now, we were uh, getting close to the end here, but we still had one and possibly the most important challenge in front of us. And that was, I couldn't afford my mortgage. Now, hackers, we got to eat just like anyone else. So we wanted to see if we can make any money off this thing. Now, obviously on stage, I would not try and sell any kind of malware. But purely hypothetically, if I was going to, I might mention that it does give you automatic discovery of all the hardware. You know, sit back and relax. It does all the recon for you. Hypothetically, of course. Um, another thing I might mention is that you get remote control through an interactive TCP session. A quick aside, 
How many of you here, show of hands, saw our original talk yesterday? Okay, that's not many. I'm going to recycle my jokes. Good. All right. So, uh, my therapist always told me that two-way communication is key to any healthy relationship, and so we decided to let you communicate with the malware through an interactive TCP session. Now, am I saying this malware is going to fix your marriage? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Okay, next, you can actually see the state of all the hardware in real time, so you can see exactly how much damage you're causing. And last but not least, send a single command and you revert the device to its original, unhacked state, wiping out of any traces the malware is ever there. Best of all, if you call in the next 30 minutes, hypothetically, you could get all this and more for 30,000 easy payments of 1995, shipping and handling not included. And if you're still not convinced, be sure to walk over 10 feet that way uh, after the talk is over to check out our presentation. You can see this bad boy in action. But to show you a quick uh, overview of how this looks uh, in uh, the real world, I'm going to hand it back to Doug. Thanks, Mark. And just to be clear, we're having some fun joking around, but we are in no way releasing the exploit code, malware code, or selling anything. Um, I don't want to get fired, and my boss is sitting right here. So. <laughs> Okay, so now that, now that we've gone through a little bit of the challenges and a really high overview of how this works, what does this really look like? And one of our missions at, uh, at McAfee's ATR team is we really want to demonstrate these in, in a means that it's really easy for everyone to see what the impact is. And because of that, we actually took the time to build a fully working demo unit, which as Mark said, is literally 10 feet over there afterwards if you want to see it in action. But I'll show you the demos as videos right now since they won't let us wheel it over. Um, so. What we built was a fully functional HVAC unit that's uh, cooling a simulated data center. Because why a data center? Because this is one of the uses that this exact model is used for. We actually hired an, an installer that installs these on a regular basis to build this, and one of the main things they install it in is in data centers. Again, we're going for as realistic as possible. So if we take a look at what this unit looks like, <coughs> excuse me, on the backhand side, you see all the components of a normal working HVAC system. So we've got the valves, we've got fans, we've got pumps, <coughs> and all, all this is doing is, is taking cold water from a cold water bin and using that to send cold air into our simulated data unit. You might say there's not usually cold water in a real unit, but again, my boss was too cheap to buy an actual condenser, so that's what we were working with. On the other side, we have a, gla a glassed in simulated data center. We've got all this, again, HVAC equipment that you'd see in a data center, and we even have a raised floor with a server sitting on it generating heat. For a moment, I'll bring your attention to one of the sensors. It's the independent temperature sensor. This is the only component not hooked up to the Delta system because it gives us ground truth for what the temperature is regardless of how much we mess the system up. On the top, we have some simple LEDs indicating different states of the equipment. Again, mostly just so it's e visually easy to see, but the most important one is the alarm. <clears throat> And the alarm's an interesting one because in, in real life, the alarm could be done one of two ways. It could simply be an LED, it could also be a siren, but more frequently, the alarm is used for like email notification so that somebody knows this system's in distress. So anytime we talk about the alarm, that covers all of those. The attacker would be able to manipulate that as well. So <clears throat> I'm gonna show you what this would actually look like if someone attacks it using our premium malware, which will help pay for Mark's mortgage. On the upper left hand, uh, right hand side of the left hand side of the screen, you see the attacker uh, running the exploit script that we ran. On the top so right hand side of the screen, you see the uh, the Delta controller picture in picture. As the attacker launches the exploit, leverages the vulnerability, it downloads our malware and a few other fun images, and this reboots the system to leverage that LD preload method that Mark talked about. Here you can see we've replaced the images just to prove that it's hacked. Um, we no one would ever actually do this in the real world, but we're just going for a visual representation. Also, we're logging in to follow along, but no one actually needs to touch or log in the system. So what are some of the things the attacker might do once they got to this point on the system? Well, one thing they might do is control the outputs of the system. The system takes input and based on those inputs have a reaction to the outputs. So here what you're seeing is the attacker manually override uh, several of the outputs on the screen one at a time. <laughs> in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, you will also see that the, the system is reacting accordingly. So the pump shutting off, the alarms turning off, etc. On the top right hand of this 
part of the screen, you'll notice that the delta screen is not reacting. In fact, it's still staying in its previous state. This is because our premium malware has the ability to adjust or not adjust the screen based on the attacker's will. And if we start talking about alerting, alerting or whether the user is aware, this is a very important feature. So what you just saw, turning stuff on and off, that's binary outputs. These systems typically have both analog and binary outputs. And all analog means is they're set to some floating point value instead of just on or off. So to manipulate those, the attacker can do that as well through the same interface. This time that you will see the delta screen update because we're going to have the attacker choose to update the screen. So they're going to change the fan speed in the valve and you can again see the component reacting appropriately in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Also, what we've done in this malware is provided a reset function which sets everything back to its original programming without removing the malware's presence. So it kind of gives the attacker a way to put things back and still have persistence on the device. <coughs> so controlling outputs are fun, but it would be a lot of work for an attacker to have to manipulate all the outputs in order to get the outcome that they wanted. Remember I mentioned that these systems are designed to take input and based on that input perform some action. So instead of controlling the outputs, if we ma manipulated the incoming data, then the, the rest of the system would just function as normally. So in the world of HVAC, if the system thought it was reading 30 and 40 degrees from the data center, what would it do? It would do the same thing your house HVAC would do. It would turn itself off because it has no need to cool. That's exactly what we have going on here. And you can see our independent temperature sensor in the bottom right hand corner, the temperature is rising. Alarms are not going to trigger because the system doesn't think it's in distress. You know, all the, all the valves or dampers and stuff, they're going to close on their own without the attacker doing anything because that's how the system's programmed to react when it thinks it's only 30 or 40 degrees inside the data center. So this is actually a more impactful scenario controlling the inputs than the outputs. And a data center, again, is just one example of how, this, um, how these would work in the real world. But think about you know, a major corporation, insert your favorite name, cloud provider, and if their data center was to lose HVAC f for a couple days without their technicians knowing being any of the wiser, we could probably impact a pretty large portion of the internet. But we want to highlight that data centers are not the only thing. Because this is a building controller and it's not agnostic to one industry, these are installed across a very wide range of industries. And I'm going to highlight a couple of examples in those industries just so we understand the impact beyond melting down a data center. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the healthcare industry. And the healthcare is slightly unique in the fact that building controllers control pressure in, in individual rooms throughout a hospital. And what do I mean by controlling pressure? <laughs> well, by setting the pressure in different er, er, I'm sorry, by setting the pressure in different rooms to different degrees, the, it prevents the spread of disease. So by having a positive pressure in one room and negative pressure in the other room, diseases can't travel from one side of the hospital to the other side. The other unique thing about controlling pressure is it's just a very, very small change in pressure. Unlike temperature, you might walk into a room and say, hey, it's kind of hot in here. If you walk into a room, you're not going to say, hey, the pressure is kind of low in here, right? So the human's not going to notice that change. It's a very small change. And if an attacker was to get on one of these systems, make it so the hospital pressure was even throughout everything. I'm talking the OR, you know, the quarantine room, the rooms where they're housing critical diseases or samples. All of a sudden, all that stuff would be able to travel airborne throughout the hospital. And that could actually affect human life. <laughs> That's a pretty interesting scenario. If we, we talk about um, the government sector for a moment, I only bring up this one because we did some online uh, open source intelligence research and found that these systems are actually being used in certain government buildings, state governments, um, for access control. Well, if you think about that impact, if we were able to access one of these systems in a state government building for access control, I don't think I have to go into too much detail on, at a hacker conference of what that would provide, right? Uh, we would be able to access maybe sensitive data that we weren't supposed to get to, social our way, engineer our way in. And last but not least, I'll take a moment just to highlight education, just because I think it's a, one that people are probably asking themselves, why do I care if you can affect the HVAC system in my kid's preschool? And what I would argue is we, we often forget that because this system is completely accessible over the internet and remotely exploitable, it's not only about the system itself. Unfortunately, we, don't, we find that a lot of times these are not air-gapped and there's other systems on the network and being able to control a system that's on the network in 100% capacity would allow us to potentially view video feeds that are going over the network or compromise other, net, uh, other systems on the network, which all of a sudden you might care a little bit more about than just the temperature. But don't worry, 
um, no one would actually connect these systems to the network, so we really have nothing to worry about from a network perspective. Oh, that, I forgot about that. So Shodan does show us it's a little different than the optimal version. So at the time that we originally did this, the exact model uh, that we uh, exploited with, uh, that has the vulnerable firmware, um, there was about 500 of these on the internet at the given time. Um, and the thing was, where we discovered this vulnerability is pretty low on, in the firm, uh, pretty low on the stack, and it's because it digests the BACnet protocol. It's actually used across multiple of Delta Control's devices. It's not specific to this Delta Control unit. And if we, we look at those numbers connected to the internet, all of a sudden we get to about 1,700 connected uh, to the internet that has the potential to be vulnerable to this vulnerability. The give or take 10% or so for honeypots that we found on the, net, on, on the the internet as well. So with that said, I think we've, we've covered just about all of the, the impact and the details of the vulnerability. I want to take a moment to highlight the vendor for this. Uh, per McAfee's responsible disclosure policy, we disclosed to the vendor uh, that we found this bug and everything that we were able to do with it in late 2018. A CVE number was generated. And then we worked very closely with the vendor, and in 2009, uh, June of 2019, the vendor released a patch. Uh, ATR has tested the patch and is happy to confirm the patch fully does mitigate this issue. Uh, and I also want to take a moment just to say that uh, Delta was awesome to work with, and they were kind of what I'd like to see as the gold standard going forward for security researchers releasing bugs. Uh, I, a lot of times, I've been in the industry for almost 10 years, and there's a lot of bad blood sometimes between uh, security vendors or security researchers and vendors. Uh, these guys were extremely receptive to the information we provided them with. They worked with us very closely to make sure the system has been patched. And this is really what we want to see from all the vendors in the industry. We're not trying to do anything negative. We're actually trying to help you and find these bugs before the bad guys do. And this this is really a good example on, on how effective that can be if you can get a good relationship with a vendor because they're actively patching these systems right now. Now, we've actually already seen the patch being applied and less of these systems vulnerable on the internet. So uh, thank you for your time. Mark and I will, will be here at the, our demo station, which is, again, literally 10 or 20 feet over there. We're happy to answer any questions you might have further. Or, and I think we're probably at, we're going to get off stage here. So any questions you have, please uh, come to our station. Thank you.